Welcome to Versed, the ASCAP podcast. I'm Eric Philbrook. Coming up in this episode, Sarah Feingold talks to Tony Award winners and Oscar and Grammy nominees Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty, best known for their Broadway hits, Ragtime and Once on this Island, who have written a song for the powerful new documentary, Nazarene. And later, I speak to Allison Russell, founding member of two musical groups, Birds of Chicago and Our Native Daughters, about her stunning new solo album and how she turned painful memories into powerful music. But first, to help me kick things off with a discussion about music and film, I am joined by Charlie Sextro, Senior Programmer for the Sundance Film Festival, which started yesterday, Thursday, January 28th, and continues through Wednesday, February 3rd. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a busy week. This is the big game for you um, this week, so uh, uh, we appreciate you carving out some time to chat with us a little bit. Um, so, so you're a senior programmer at the Sundance Film Festival. That sounds like the coolest job in the world. Do you want to just give us a little uh, overview of what your what your role entails? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's always important to first uh, explain to people the job programmer. I think a lot of people in the world assume that means if someone's a programmer that they code um, stuff for the I have nothing to do technical. It's a curatorial role at Sundance. So I... About, it's been about 10 years um, that I've been on the programming team of selecting the feature length films, which means, you know, watching hundreds and hundreds of movies every single year um, and uh, being and then having really um, <laughs> intense conversations with very smart people uh, with differing uh, opinions uh, about what um, we find to be valuable and um, kind of exciting. So. That's the job. Uh, it's, it's really that's the bulk of the work is uh, watching a lot of movies and talking about them. But there is a lot of other work within the festival that we all have and just kind of organizing, organizing, planning. Um, I help create the entire screening schedule for the festival. Wow. Um, so we each kind of have our different other jobs that we have that we kind of really oversee and uh, kind of apply to the festival. Right. And I know uh, like a lot of organizations uh you know sundance's mission has evolved um you know the festival has always uh sought to uh bring n different voices diverse voices from around the world um how is it how has it changed over the last year especially as as uh you know so much is going on in our society and in, in, in the world yeah you know i would say you know, at the at the beginning, we we for, we fortunately had a festival last year, last January. So we really lucked out timing wise to be able to have our festival late January, um, and so we've gotten a really long runway compared to m almost every other major film festival in our planning and conceiving. So already back in March and April, we. Um, started planning what the festival could be like, just making up ideas. And we have a new director of the festival, Tabitha Jackson. And her immediate thing was to come to the programming team and to ask us, you know, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. We need to figure that out. But also, how do we make this now in this crazy world that's going on? How do we add things that we've always wanted? Like, how do we, how do we make it better um, than what we've had before? And so I think speaking to diverse audiences, um, and, uh, um, you know, the festival has always historically taken place in Park City. Who can get there? Who can afford to get there? Who can cram into that space? It's always, you know, a real bottleneck of people. Mm -hmm. So that's limited who's been able to actually experience the festival. So an exciting thing from the beginning was like, now that our festival is online, virtual, all the projects in the festival are available online on our platform that we've created. It means our audience is different than we've ever had. We are able to get these films to allow people who have never had the opportunity to visit Sundance, to be there in the moment watching movies, discovering them at the exact same time that film critics are, that big buyers are, industry, um, jury members, everything. Like we can now bring this um, festival in a far more accessible way to audiences. So. For us, it's all about, you know, art and audiences. So that I think is the real exciting change is like, 
who, you know, it's like, I'm sending tickets to my, you know, my mom and my brother and like my friends and they're gonna be there at the world premiere too. Um, and they've never been able to. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that, how, who we can now access and who gets to actually experience and weigh in um, in the process. Right. Um, well, ASCAP has cherished our partnership with Sundance all these years. We've, you know, we've put on our Sundance ASCAP Music Cafe every year, which highlights music. Uh, music has always played a, a starring role in so many films at Sundance over the years. Um, do you actually look for music documentaries or, or films that feature music in some way? Is that part of the, uh, the, the, you know, the recipe each year when you're looking to choose films for the festival? You know, it's, it, it would seem that way because we always are playing certainly music documentaries, but stuff that's even, you know, artist, um, music artists con connected or, or driven. Um, but I just honestly, like I, I am as passionate as I am about uh, a film, I am about music and music documentaries, it's just a really special genre, I feel like. Uh, um, and it's such a powerful, connection of art forms that I think just perfectly kind of coalesce together. And so I just, I think it is more so there are just always great music documentaries coming through. Right. Like I think that that is just an inherent thing every year I'm, I, I see music documentaries and it's no, it's never telling if it's an artist I know um, and I'm passionate about or one that I've never heard of before in my life before. And you just sit down and have this experience where it's just, you know, really kind of transcendent experience. So it is not by design. Um, it just naturally is that way. It's just, a, you know, a powerful genre of storytelling. Right. Um, speaking of which, uh, this year there is a, a, document, a music documentary, um, The Sparks Brothers, directed by Edgar Wright. Um, we were just talking a little bit before about uh, how special this film is. Uh, what, what do you think this is going to uh, to bring to the table in terms of uh, entertaining and, and, and informing audiences about this this group, the Sparks Brothers? Yeah, I mean, there's a very clear directive from Edgar Wright. You know, you rarely get a, a, a music documentary that has a hypothesis. And this film exactly has the hypothesis. And Edgar Wright is trying to connect the dots and make the argument that the Sparks Brothers, who this year will be have um, been releasing um, their 50 years of music. They've been uh, making music together this year. Um, that his uh, kind of hypothesis is that they are one of the most influential artists in the past 50 years and have had a major impact on all so many different types of art forms and yet they're artists that have never broken through and so he is trying to make that argument to you and i think he is very convincing in that argument um and you fall in love with them um you love fall in love with their spirit their uh humanity uh their independence and innovation and they are almost comic uh, cartoon characters and how funny and playful they are as personalities. So it is an absolute joy from anyone who has never heard of them before to, um, to people that are die, die hard. You know, his, it's, the thing is that these are artists, these are musicians, musician, and he just wanted to convince um, everyone in the world um, and, and, and hopefully like, this year, they have this documentary, but they also have a musical um, that Leos Carax uh, directed. Great, incredible, like master French filmmaker that should be coming out later this year too. And it's like 50 years in, this actually might be the year that the Sparks, the biggest year ever for the Sparks Brothers, which is incredible. Well, I hope so. It's, uh, they're, 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 they're just so wonderful, so entertaining. And uh, I hope the world discovers them um, this year. Um, so there's another uh, music documentary uh, in the festival this year, Summer of Soul, directed by Questlove. Um, what can you tell us about that? I, I will say, too, is like I talked about my passion for music documentaries. I love to watch all of them um, that come through. The team knows that just like funnel music documentaries to me because I just love watching them so much. And these two documentaries, The Sparks Brothers and Summer of Soul, which are big kind of music documentaries this year, I know hyperbole, I'm 
full wholeheartedly believe are two of the best music documentaries I've ever seen. They, they are going on my list of uh, kind of music documentaries that are most meaningful to me as an experience. So Summer of Soul is, it's a real revelation. Um, uh, looking at the um, 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival. Um, so this festival had 300,000 people attend um, in the summer of 1969, the exact same summer as Woodstock. 400,000 people attended Woodstock, and yet the Harlem Cultural Festival is basically not known, not discussed, and not a, a part of uh, our kind of collective understanding of like culture in the past hundred years where Woodstock has been nonstop. And so what Questlove is trying to do, there was a film shot of this festival and the, it was a, a celebration of African American artists, um, Nina Simone, B.B. King, Sly and the Family Stone, Gladys Knight, Stevie Wonder, Fifth Dimension, incredible performances, all never seen before. A film was shot just like the Woodstock film was shot but no one bought it, no one put it out and no one really knows about it. The film, so what he does is he looks at these performances, these artists, why they were specifically meaningful at that time, what they said about culture at that time. And, but, and he, so he's just telling you so much about like the time period in the world and culture at that time, but he's also within it too exploring that people who attended it, it's almost um, seen as like a dream that they had because there's not photos around of it. They never watched a documentary on it. It's not discussed. And so you have people who attended it as a kid who are watching the footage for the first time crying, being like, see, I knew, I knew it happened. I knew it existed. Society as a whole was not letting it, you know, like exist in the kind of a, a, our public uh, understanding and consciousness. But now again, just like the Sparks Brothers is like, really kind of convincing you like you don't know about these guys but they are important to you quest love with this documentary just really masterful documentary is telling you like you've been robbed of this story and here it is for the first time wow that's wonderful it's a very passionate endorsement for that film um i stand behind it you you i i i i feel like it is going to be you know really one of the big films of the festival and one of the big films of the next year um so Obviously, the festival is a lot different this year. Everyone's had to sort of, uh, you know, uh, rethink and reimagine what what this uh, what this can be. Um, how do you feel about you know where everything stands now? The festival's only a you know while well, when this podcast airs, it it'll be launching uh, today. Um, so uh, how does the team feel about uh, what you guys have put together this year? I mean, it's really exciting. That's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, we've had to create, you know, what took over 30 years to create uh, and, and, and refine what the Sundance Film Festival was and the experience was that we've been having as a live festival in Park City. Um, that's taken over 30 years to really kind of perfect. And we had nine months to um, create it from the ground up and start over um, with, a, like I mentioned, a brand new director of the festival who was just digging in for the first time as everything started to happen in the world. And so, yeah, it's now happening, you know, like we've created a, a totally unique uh, platform to experience the stuff that is interactive in a lot of different ways. Every film will have, um, after its world premiere, is gonna have a live interactive Q&A with the audience. Um, every, uh, um, we've created online spaces in our new frontier, um, um, section of the festival where we have, it's, it's kind of incredible thing where it's a virtual space where you create an avatar and you run around, other people are there, you see the avatar with their face. And when you get close to the person, you can choose to click into a conversation with them and you're picture goes away and a zoom little zoom window appears and you can now talk to that person. So we've created a virtual way for you to go hang out and meet strangers and talk about the movies that you've seen. So we've done a lot of planning and now it's all happening. You know, we wondered if they would come in this space and, you know, stuff is sell sold out selling, you know, like moving quickly um, and people are going to be taking part. So 
I feel like all the pieces are now there. We have the movies. That was a question. You know, were yeah. we going to get good movies? Were people making movies in this past year? And we have a program that is smaller than past years, 70 films compared to 120 in previous years. But it's Sundance. Like it is as someone I've been there for 10 years, like this program is so Sundance. So like we have uh, uh, something truly representative of, of, of what we want and to, we feel like is important, valuable to the world. And now we're just gonna beam it off across the country and uh, um, let's hope it works. Now I'd like to hand the mic over to our resident musical theater aficionado, Sarah Feingold, for her conversation with Broadway masterminds and longtime writing partners, Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty. They recently wrote a song performed by Angelique Kijo for the powerful new documentary, Nazrine. Their chat also digs deep into their storied career, collaborating on projects for the stage and screen, from Anastasia to Once on this Island and all the magic moments they've shared along the way. Take it away, Sarah. I want to start off just by thanking you guys for giving me the time. I'm a huge fan of the genre and of your work, so this is a real treat for me. Um, so thank you so much for giving us the time. I think this is going to be really fun. Um, I do want to start off talking about the original song that you wrote for the documentary Nasreen, How Can I Tell You. Uh, it's performed by Angelique Kijo. Um, the documentary is a really intense, really moving story about um, Nasreen Satudeh. Um, this pioneering Iranian human rights activist. Um, so I would love to start just by asking how you got involved in the piece and what the process was like uh, writing the song for that piece. Yeah, yeah, uh, we got to know the filmmakers, uh, Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross, uh, because they had, their previous film was a documentary called uh, Every Act of Life, which was all about uh, our dear friend and collaborator, Terrence McNally. And we had written uh, three shows with Terrence, and uh, this was all about his life. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we appeared in the film and got to know them. And uh, secretly during uh, the creation of that film, they were also working on another film that would become Nazarene. Uh, and they showed us, uh, well, for, first of all, they felt there was a song that was needed for it. They wanted to have uh, a piece of music basically to sum up her life, her work, and uh, what her movement was about. So uh, they thought that we might be good uh, people to possibly write that. So they approached us and gave us uh, a rough cut of the film. And uh, we both found it incredibly powerful, very moving. And uh, we, we didn't even have to discuss it, Lynn and I. We just felt this is something we really want to be a part of. And we just really connected with this woman and with what she had to say in the world. Um, one of the amazing things that I'll just add is um, Jeff and Marsha uh, gave us a, a few of Nazarene's letters to read. And these were letters that she had written home to her children from her prison cell. And um, I guess they got them from her husband. They were so incredible and be beautiful and simple. And you know, in a way she was trying to explain to her children why she couldn't come home and why she chose this path in life. And she encouraged them to, to pray for her fellow prisoners and to pray for the guards and to pray for the judges. And it was so, um, so incredibly heartfelt and moving. And I just thought, this is the essence of the woman that we need to capture in this song. You know, we're usually writing for fictional characters and musicals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we care about them too, and we love them and, and you know, try to do them justice. But this was a real person um, going on this incredibly difficult journey. And, and we just thought these letters, you know, somehow illuminated her, her heart. Um, and uh, for all you ASCAP songwriters out there, um, I'm one of those songwriters who likes to get the music first, just in case anybody's wondering. And um, Stephen was kind enough to write this gorgeous, gorgeous melody that just was so inspiring. And I, I have told him this, but the, the first few notes, the, the little vamp that the song starts with, reminded me of somebody sitting in a prison cell looking out of a window with bars on it and seeing the sky or seeing the stars. And I, uh, I just took that idea and I thought, oh, it's the letters. I have to embody the letters in the lyrics. So, you know, that's, that was kind of the genesis of, of the particular song. The, from the letters to the music to a lyricist, um, you know, seeing something. I, I'm always amazed at 
what you can put across just in music alone, you know, because I, I was uh, working at my piano where I uh, usually create a lot of our music. And uh, I had a photograph of Nazarene in front of me. And I was trying to understand to get in, into sort of the emotional space where the song would begin. And I thought it, it had to begin small in a, in a sense of isolation because she's separated from her family, from her community, from those that love her. And uh, what, what Lynn took as the, the figure that it's the stars through the bars, uh, f for me, it was actually her trying to put her message across time and space. You know, so so th that little figure meant that to me, that the idea that uh, it would start at a place of isolation and then gradually as the song would gain momentum, it would become about something much larger than herself and actually in connecting with other people. So uh, we, in the arrangement, we worked it so there were uh, other voices that would join as it went, went on. And uh, the ending, I, I thought, was really beautiful for, for me I felt like I wanted to iris down again to her you know uh, musically and uh, what Lynn did is she made it a little PS almost like the signing the end uh, the end of the letter and that was so beautiful and unexpected to me so I guess in songwriting you know I try to give Lynn something that she then responds to and at, at the same time it surprises me oh, that's so that's that's what what collaborations all about yeah I love I love getting that sort of very specific tidbit about your collaboration because you've been working together for this wonderful career and it's great to know you know sort of what makes you both tick together and yeah. well it's, it's different each time you know that's the thing I think it, a lot of people think oh songwriting here's how it works you know <laughs> like add water and stir and in fact each project's very different uh, each song is very different the process uh, differs but yes Lynn does like music first, if I can come up with even like a, uh, you know, a little bit of musical fabric. It doesn't have to be a whole song or a melody, but just something that indicates what the emotional uh, moment might be. Yeah, it's sort of you know, uh, Marilyn, Marilyn Bergman, um, I think it was Marilyn who once said that the, the words are on the tips of the notes. And I so when I heard that quote, I thought, oh, yes, indeed, she's so right. You know, yeah. that you just, it just, they just come so easily when, when the music is there. You you both said things that are a very good segue into the next question I wanted to ask, which is about when you were discussing how most of the time you're writing for fictional characters. Mm -hmm. um, and you both were saying you saw the film and you learned about Nazarene and then that's when you started to write the song. And the film is, um, it's very powerful, but it's very, it's devastating. Um, it's, yes. it's a very difficult watch. It's, it's uplifting in how strong and incredible these people are and the way they're fighting for everybody to live with dignity, but it's also can be really, really difficult to watch. And I'm wondering if you had to do any compartmentalization when you were working on this project uh, because the subject matter is real and so um, affecting. Um. You know, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I didn't find that I had to do that. In fact, I found that the more I knew and the more I saw, the more um, passionate I became about being involved in the project and wanting to do the best for her. And, uh, you know, I think in the best of all possible worlds, you write a song and it creates some kind of ripple effect into the world. And maybe the song will ripple out and people will make donations into her release into her legal defense and to um you know causes that she believes in and works for and one of the things that i love about her and you saw it in the film which i i found so terrific was she loves the arts she goes to museums mm -hmm. and she collects pictures and you know she she loves music and um she feels that music is one of the best ways to to stand up against tyranny and you know you as a songwriter you you, you think well yes maybe that's true maybe something i did might help and i don't think we ever really set out to change the world but sometimes you know one of our songs goes out there and becomes some sort of a meaningful thing for you know like uh, make them hear you from ragtime recently it's it's become adopted by the black lives matter movement and how fabulous how wonderful that you know they can take our our work and speak speak to power so you know i think i think an answer short answer to your question is no i didn't i didn't compartmentalize at all in fact i tried to become a part of that story 
Yeah, and and, and uh, she's she's such an emotionally giving person and a very generous person uh, in terms of just her spirit and her work. And so I focused on that. I, I, I just thought I really want this song to be generous. I want it to go out into the world. I would love it to uh, give her work and her story uh Make make more people aware of it, you know. And the way uh, Angelique Kijo, who sings the song, performs it, it's not like a laid back. It's a call to arms kind of song, and and you know, I think I think that uh, element is really exciting and really important. And obviously, we love people to uh, learn more about her story and become involved. Yeah, and was there anything about writing this piece that was particularly challenging that? Um, asked of you something that you sort of hadn't really um, dealt with before or was something that you were like, oh, hey, that's a, that's a challenge that I haven't faced or was this just a case by case, every song is different? Well, Lynn, I, I don't know that we've ever written a song uh, about a person trying to en encapsulate their life and their work, uh, certainly a living person, you know, obviously in ragtime, there's Henry Ford and J.P. Morgan and various uh, celebrities, celebrities of the day, but I, I don't think We've ever done that, have we? Um, Another I example. So. I don't think so. I think the most challenging thing was was realizing that at some point she would hear it, and her mm -hmm. family would hear yeah. it, and what would they think? They loved it actually, and um, she met, she heard it over the phone from prison, and and then um, and her husband received a recording of it and loved it, and then she was given uh, a two week leave to come home, a medical leave from prison because. She had gone on this extreme hunger strike and became very weak and debilitated and needed to have some medical care. And she came home. And, and so when she was home, I believe she I know she heard the song and I believe she also saw the movie, um, which is pretty extraordinary when you think about it. And then she had to go back to prison. They grabbed her and pulled her right back. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a tough story. It's a really tough story. But she is such a she's like a spirit of light, you know, even she's talking in one scene in the movie, she's talking to her children behind the glass, um, you know, where the, the in prison. Yeah, the phone has the phone and her daughter's crying. Yeah. Her daughter's crying, but she's playing a game with her son, you know, and laughing and it's, it's really moving and beautiful. And she is a light, light, positive spirit, even though she's as courageous and tough as nails, you know. Um, she doesn't come across that way. She's very soft. So we try to, you know, capture that. Yeah, it sounds like this is a course of like, go, go on, Stephen. No, I was, I was just going to say it, it is somewhat daunting when you get in, you know, like four minutes or four minutes and change and you have to encapsulate the spirit of somebody's life and life's work, you know, and it's, it's, it's really an honor, but it really raises the bar high. And, you know, because you really want it to be specific and you don't, you don't want the song to be this general thing, you know, because it's really about a specific person and her series of choices. And um, it was interesting because when we were writing the song, we had not met the family. You know, we, were, we just were watching uh, the family on, you know, in this rough cut. And since, since we've written the song, we actually had a Zoom conversation with Reza, her husband, and the two kids, uh, actually last Monday. Uh, with Angelique Kijo uh, coming in from Paris. So it was like a spectacular use of Zoom, you know. To, and Stephen is in Mexico we, now. So in Mexico. we had Mexico, we had California where the filmmakers are. I was in New York, Angelique was in Paris, and Reza and the kids were in Tehran. So, and it, it was fabulous. And it was so wonderful to meet them all face to face. I mean, that is one of the positive things you can say about Zoom <laughs> is that, you know, it's enabling these anybody to join in, you know, and that's, that's wonderful. And, and her, uh, her husband, Reza, he wanted to let both of us know that the kids loved music, like virtually more than anything else, you know, and they play instruments. One is a violinist, one is a pianist, mm -hmm. one is a, uh, they paint. And uh, the only thing he said they were not interested in was law. <laughs> their, their mother was trying to get them interested in law, and they said, "No, we like yeah. music more." Maybe and, not. Yeah. And they were just delightful. And I think I think they were really excited that their mother had inspired a piece of music. Yeah. And that was really cool to to have that exchange. That's that is a wonderful relationship to have built with them. And 
Mm -hmm. uh, you were mentioning Zoom, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that now we are just in Zoom's town, USA, all the time. That's right. That's right. Day and night. Day and night. Uh, yep, constantly in our little boxes. Um, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if you guys had done any um, writing or collaborating over Zoom in the past year, and what that experience has been like. And well, it's you, you know, it's there, there's something about being solitary. You know, that's like. You know what what we do is it's a, about collaboration it's about being with people it's about communicating uh 90 of our work is in the live medium where you know there are actors live on stage musicians in the pit we're you know creating music uh, and having a dialogue none of that's possible so uh early on um we uh there, there's a choral group in Washington, D.C., and they reached out to us, the Gay Men's Chorus of Washington, D.C., and they had been singing several of our songs, most notably Make Them Hear You. And uh, it was their 40th uh, anniversary of the group coming up, and they said, we would love for you to write a choral piece for us. And just the idea of creating choral singing, <laughs> you know, when you're in, in your little boxes, it, it, became, it became, you know, I think that, that that's the first... Thing that we had written you know since we had written maybe one other song but uh it was it was great to be able to again write something that felt it, it contained positive energy and was being sung by people and they they did it as a, a virtual uh premiere oh, in august and there, and there was something really wonderful about not only that but uh, lynn's lyric again it was so of the moment it was about why do we have the need to sing together as a group and and oh, how can you can feel isolated in life and like every single lyric was so emotional for what everybody was feeling you know because we couldn't get together to make music so and, and it was about it, uh how the music and the power of music uh can overcome hate speak right and i thought that was wonderful to put out sorry and, Stephen. I, I was just going to backtrack a pinch um just to to tell you that when the pandemic hit, we, Stephen and I were together in Florida uh, working on a new show. And, really? you know, obviously we, we, we had been in rehearsal for three weeks. We had like our foot extended to step onto the stage and, you know, it was all shut down. So it was very frustrating and we had to go our separate ways. And it was sort of, and we thought, oh, well, it'll be a few weeks or a month or something. But, you know, it's almost a year now. And the weird thing is that he and I have spent the past you know, 30 something years um, together in the same room, basically, you know, writing musicals, show after show after show and song after song. And all of a sudden that rug was just ripped out from underneath us. And, you know, it was it was actually quite um, shocking and difficult to really kind of reorient ourselves a little bit. So I think little by little, we've been putting our feet back into the waters of writing something new. And I think we're both pretty ready to start something new, but we do have a show pending, you know, that'll come back in 2022 in Florida. We have another show called Marie that is circling Broadway, you know, which was happening before we left for Florida. So um, a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of balls in the air, but one of the things we did manage to do, we didn't write it, but we rediscovered, um, two song cycles that we had written in 2004. They were in our trunk and we had recorded them and we pulled them out and lo and behold, they were not only beautiful, we loved them all over again, but they were sung by Marin Maisie and Jason Danielly on one song cycle. And of course our dear beloved Marin who we've lost, but um, you know, to hear that songs that have never been heard before with her and her husband singing them. And then the other one was Sarah uh, Oriart Berry and Stephen Pasquale. And that's all, I mean, like Broadway stars, you know, in our, in our trunk. And so we pulled them out and we dusted them off and they were remastered and uh, re, you know, tweaked and, and uh, enhanced a little bit digitally. And we put out a new album during this time. So that was, that was kind of wonderful too. So I know that you've, 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 you know, made the old new again and you've made some new stuff. So correct. Yeah. 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 It, it's, uh, it, it was so great uh, revisiting these song cycles because we hadn't really listened to them in, in quite a long time. And uh, uh, we should say the first one is, a, is um, about a, a farmer and his wife in upstate New York in the mid 1800s. And to have Marin and Jason who are real life husband and wife playing husband and wife, uh, it, it was wonderful. And then the second one is uh, based uh, on photographs that Lynn's father took. 
uh, of New York's of New York City in the 40s and 50s. So it had had a more contemporary, totally different kind of a feel. And Lynn, you, you should you should let Sarah know who the cover girl is. The cover, right? well, there's this gorgeous couple on the cover, and it's my my parents. It's so embarrassing. I should go get it's the album. Wonder, it's a wonderful I, I want to see it. it. It's great. Yeah, and it's them at, at Coney Island. Yeah, it's them at Coney Island. Back in the day, and they look so hip. They're wonderful. They're so hip looking. They look like they came straight out of the East Village or something. It's really a fun picture. So yeah, that, are you from a very New York, York family, Lynn? Say that again. Are you from a very New York family? Very New York. Yes. I mean, half my family was from Albany, but the other half is from Brooklyn. And um, uh, yeah, and in fact, m when I was born, I was born in Manhattan, in Atlantic Hill Hospital. And my very first apartment as a little baby was in Hell's Kitchen, right where the Lincoln Tunnel now <laughs> enters. <laughs> there was a, a, a um, tenement there that I, a five flight walk up that I was a baby in. So I'm a very New York girl, yes. Have you have you guys been around New York at all during COVID? Just curious. I have. I just got back from there from about two weeks there. Um, I loved being there. I loved being home and I miss it, you know, but we're trying to be as safe as we possibly can, you know. But um it it it's just bubbling with life. It's all coming back. It, if you can feel the energy, you can feel people just wanting to be happy you know, wanting to, to be themselves and to, you know, have it all happen again. So it was, it was wonderful to be back. I mean, it was, it was interesting because um, they, I think our production got shut down in like, it was weird because Broadway had shut down, but regional theater had not and we're in Florida, which is, you know, very controversial state to begin with. And so um, I, I was in New York just for like two days and it was St. Patrick's day. And I couldn't believe I could not find a, there no single Irish pub. You know, it was open, no parade. And but uh, I I was uh, there for three months, this three and a half months actually this fall. Right. And it, it was it was interesting to you know to to see it. If you'll allow mm -hmm. me, I would love to talk about some uh, pre-mask world things, so we mm -hmm. can go into some of the other things that you guys have written. Um, I'd love oh. to talk about once on this island because I was born in 1992. And I was a musical theater kid, so I was in lots of productions of Once on This Island growing up. It was, you know, one of those shows that you makes you love musical theater. You learn about all these wonderful things. Um, so, and I know that that revival, it, I believe it came from Playwrights Horizons, or uh, the initial well, run was Playwrights Horizons and then Broadway? That's yes. Right. The original one was Playwrights Horizons and the Broadway one was, the revival was a, another production, yeah. And I, I always right. love hearing about the changes that shows go through when they go from off Broadway to Broadway um, and the reasons for making those changes. And so I was wondering if you guys could give me some examples of how Once on this Island developed in its various stages. Well, you know, it's, first of all, Play Playwrights Horizons, that was the second show we got to do there. And it, it, it's so important, uh, I think, for young writers, writers coming up through the ranks to have some place uh, that they can call their musical home. And so we had done a crazy first show there called Lucky Stiff. And uh, Andre Bishop- Lucky Stiff was a show that like my high school community <laughs> theater used to do like every four years, they would do a lot of it's, it's very, <laughs> it's, so, it's so bizarre, it's very strange. There's nothing like a dead body in a wheelchair to make I it- I know. Happen. You have to yeah. do Lucky Stiff, it's fun. So, yeah, and, and so so the, the follow up, believe it or not, was once on this island. And they just said, what, what would you like to, what do you need to develop this? And we felt uh, that we needed um, some sort of a recording so we could understand what the vocals were like. And then we did a workshop. And then um, there were actually very few changes, oddly. This, is, this was a, the fastest show we had ever written. We wrote the, the first draft of the entire show, 90 minute show in six months. And then we uh, tinkered, like took out, I think two songs and added two. And uh, once we were up, at Playwrights Horizons, I don't think we made any changes. I don't think the only changes were in staging. terms of the staging because Playwrights Horizons at the time only had one wing. It's so, for one side, our director, our wonderful Graziella Danielle, she would go running with her head to try and bash a hole in the wall on the other side. So when we got to Broadway, she had two two wings, and then she didn't know what to do with. I don't the know second. what to do with the other one. <laughs> yeah. um, but we didn't make any textual changes. Interestingly, when it came back in this recent 2018 revival. Um, 
it, it was such a different production. First of all, the production was night and day. The, the Graziella's production was this gorgeous, simply told, um, colorful uh, fable, musical fable, really. And it, it just looked so amazing. It just, it, it, the walls were just painted like a Haitian painting, just blue sky and trees, basically palm trees. And then the people entered and populated the world. And, you know, and it was so simple. The revival was simple in its own, it looked simple, but it was incredibly complicated because it was in the round. Everything was in done in sand. There was a bed of sand, you know, the whole stage was sand. And to dance in sand, to act in sand, to keep speakers out of the sand, to hide the speakers because they're in full view of the audience, to create a car in the rain with pieces of junk, to, um, you know, I mean, it was, it was such a different production and stunning in its own way. And we, we only made one tiny text change, lyric change, um, which was just the very beginning of the Daniel, uh, the Daniel scene is called Timun discovers Daniel. It's when she arrives at the hotel of Bozom and finds this boy that she's traveled across the island to find. And we added a tiny little bit of sung material, sort of semi-sung material right there at the request of Michael Arden, um, our genius director. And yeah. we did that, but that's the only, re it, it never really changed a word from its opening at off Broadway to its Broadway incarnation, to its revival incarnation. Uh, it just everything changed around what we wrote, which is yeah. very interesting, you know, for for writers to to see what can become of their work. And, and, and I and the mo the little scene that we had tweaked, I, it seemed like a no brainer. Like uh, when when we realized what the solution would would yeah. be, and I said to Lynn, I said, "How come we never did that in 1990?" And, and it dawned on us we just ran out of time. You know, there are certain mm -hmm. certain we, we had like, open. But that works well enough. Let's move on. And you yeah. know, I don't think we ever got back to it. You know. Until, no, but, you know, we, we made not too long ago, a few years ago, um, when Terrence was still alive, we made a little change in ragtime. And it was one of those same, why did we never think of this? It seemed like a no brainer. But all those many years of objectivity later, um, we did that rewrite. So, you know, but once on this island, it's just one of those shows. The, the one, the thing I love about it is, is it gets done everywhere by kids. You know, kid, as you said, kids just do it all over in schools. And I saw one production, I, I think Stephen, you didn't get to see it, but it was 86 children of every shape, size, color, ethnicity, everything. One teacher had made all the costumes, which was amazing. And they had shells and beads and feathers and it was stunning. And it, it just was such an amazing experience to be. And they came down the aisles, you know, you were surrounded by children and they even around the proscenium, they had like little tiers where kids could sit going all up the proscenium, which were faced with waves, right? So it was like they were sitting in the water and they, those kids just did a lot of this, you know? And I thought that maybe they were the kids who didn't have the dance chops. <laughs> it was so adorable. Bless so, that teacher. Oh man. Sometimes yeah. I look at some of these productions and I'm like, this, this teacher as musical director is working overtime and it is beautiful. Ooh. And I seeing stuff like that just makes my heart. Bro. And I yeah. have a, a close friend who I grew up with who we were in musical theater together as little kids. And now he works at a school and directs their uh, musicals. And it's just a very. I think that's wonderful. I mean, when you think of your early ex experiences, you know, uh, we, we had an incredible drama teacher at my school. And my school was very tiny, it was an all boys Catholic school. And there were only 90 of us in our graduating class. And we had absolutely no arts budget. And that said, if there's something to be said for trying to create a whole world out of some used lumber, <laughs> a little bit of paint and some cardboard, you know, because it forced you actually to be more creative because we had such limited stuff. And um, that, that's where I wrote my first show when I was 14. And they were so encouraging. And it was, it was really an important time, you know, when you're just getting started. And, you know, I, I was lucky that I had a great music teacher and a great drama teacher who just sort of opened this door to music and theater for me. Yeah, so great. That stuff changed I your life. I didn't have it, it did. I don't know what I would be doing, but it wouldn't be as exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always look at my friend who's uh, directing musicals now, and I say, those kids are so lucky that they have you, and I can't wait to see what they do one day. Cause yes, it's, it's wonderful. I get from him, yeah. Um, and I'm curious, I, I believe that the Once on this Island revival, which I saw, um, it was beautiful. 
I, I like you said, when I always feel there's really interesting experimental stuff going on at Circle in the Square, like. I always yeah. go there and I end up seeing like the craziest things I've ever seen on Broadway. Um, but I know that um, Once in this Island was going to tour, correct? Before COVID? It did. It, it did and it shut down prematurely. Oh, it, it, it opened in, um, I think, the end of September, beginning of October in Nashville. Okay. And then we were just getting our mojo and getting into our rhythm. And the, the cast for this tour was extraordinary. In fact, I think five or six of the original Broadway folks, they just loved it and they wanted to be with it. So. It was a really strong cast, and we were about to go to Los Angeles to the Amundsen, where I think we were doing like six or seven weeks. It was going to be like a big sit down in Los Angeles, and that's that's when everything began to shut down. So, are you guys planning right now um, on returning to tour after you know we can get things under control if we can? You know, knock wood. <laughs> I, I, I think I think we'll see. I mean, the the, the thing that was so so about it for sure. I don't even know what. There's no even no adjective. I, I was going to say so what. You know, what's the word that you use? It, it uh, at the in in um in March we had we had several um, productions of several shows and they were uh, in different parts of the world and we've never really had that. You know, we've had like Broadway, then that closes, then a tour happens, then that closes, and then and this was. Uh, there were there were productions all over the world, and within four days, everything, everything shut down. You know. mm -hmm. so, um, and we can't complain, really. We were lucky no. to have those productions, and you know, some of them may come back, but it it, it just was like what's happening? You know, you, you finally, like Anastasia was out there. It was in Holland and it was in um, Spain and, you know, it was oh, two productions were opening in Japan and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they all went bye-bye. Although Japan is back, interestingly enough. There's an incredible um, troupe in, ja in Japan called the Takarazuka and it's an all-female troupe. And they're an ancient troupe. They're like very old um, yeah, more than 100 years old. Yeah, and they um, are doing Anastasia as we speak. They did it first in their town of Takarazuka, now it's in Tokyo. It's all female, and so the main character it is played by one of the women who always plays male roles. The women who play the male roles are the stars. So even though it's called Anastasia, it's really about Dimitri. <laughs> you know? Love interest, yeah. who in yeah. this version is is the star. Yeah, it's so funny. So they're they're up and running, and they seem to be staying healthy and making it work somehow. So you know, there's there's a little bit of glimmer of theater again. We're we're waiting to see. You know. Yeah. And it, it, it was it was actually an interesting collaboration because a lot of the the collaboration for that was uh, was done during COVID. And so not only was there you know the pandemic and you know technical issues, but this was a completely different language. And uh, they were adapting uh, the music because they wanted to have more visuals, more movement. And uh, they asked us to write a new song for Dimitri, considering he is the star now. And uh, all, all of that was I just thought it was fascinating you know and once we once we sort of like gave over to this it became it became really interesting and the collaboration was seamless i i couldn't get over that with all of these things that could stack up against you that uh the sharing of ideas and um and music uh was 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 great and was not hindered by you know all of the things against us that is an amazing story. I would love to um, be the person who writes the oral history, does the research, because that I could I could read a whole book about this um, Japanese troupe Anastasia, where Dimitri's the star. Yeah. And uh, now that you mentioned Anastasia, I would love to talk about it. Um, was that the first project that you two did for film initially, the first musical project where the whole musical was to be on film? Um, well the first that got produced. <laughs> yeah, the first that got produced. That's a good way to put it. We had some we had some notable developments for movies that you know, sank, but uh, that was the first that got produced. Although I had worked a little bit in film before that, but you know that's that not with Steven. So um, yeah, and it was a, quite an adventure, an adventure in Hollywood, you know, um, and seeing how that world worked and going to the Oscars and, you know, we, we just, we had a good time. We really had a great time. In hindsight, it was probably a lot more fun than it was at the time, mm -hmm. because at the time you're just kind of trying to, you know, keep, stay in that movie. Just don't get fired, stay in the movie. Because <laughs> yeah, writers in Hollywood are sort of like, yeah. you know, yeah. you paper. Yeah. 
Maybe. It, it, it's very dicey if you make it to the end, but we did. And even even the very last song in the movie, which is an end credit song, they gave us the assignment. We 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 need an end credit song, and and we said, great. What 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 would it, what what are you looking for? And they said something that goes to number one. So that not a lot. Of <laughs> oh <my God>. How <laughs> bad? I <laughs> we could do that. Okay. You know? And right, we did do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. So that was good. But there was there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. So it yeah. seems um, I wanted to ask about the differences between the developing a musical for the stage and developing for a well, film with Fox. Well, I, I, um, oddly, oddly, it took us like probably almost four years from the first meeting to, um, you know, seeing it up on a screen, you know, because it, it was uh, most of it was cell painted, you know, hand done. So the process is very lengthy. But at the same time, we were also writing ragtime. And this will give you an idea of, you know, in the theater, you're much more sort of the master of your own fate, you know, as the writer. So uh, in the time that it took us to write ragtime, which was a 35 song score, we had six songs <laughs> that we had written for Anastasia. And it just shows you like the process of noting and. But each of those songs, we probably wrote three or four songs before, but they said right. on. But you know, the, the big difference between theater and, and film really is that in theater, you own your own copyright. You yeah. are the master of your own fate. Um, you know, you make it happen. Uh, you decide what to cut. You decide what's not working for better or worse. You try to, you know, get the, bring this show in. Um, and in the movies, you are a writer for hire. And although you get paid a heck of a lot more, um, you don't own your work and you uh, basically do what you're asked. You're given direction. You try to accomplish what they're looking for. If they didn't like that, there's more where that came from. And it's a constant process of collaborating with producers. So that's the big difference, uh, I think. And, you know, we're, we're good with input and with people and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we managed to, to make it to the end in one piece. But, you know, I can understand why a lot of people why it's difficult for a lot of people, you know, but they're both fun. They're both wonderful um, things to work on, I'll say. Uh, but there's, I think there's a lot, I know nah, there's grief on both sides. I mean, they're, nah, <laughs> you know. Different they're kinds of grief. But, but I, I, I have to say working at Fox, we, we were really lucky because the head of music, Robert Kraft, yeah. uh, he, um, he was also, he, he's also a, a wonderful songwriter and composer in his own right. So it wasn't like you were having conversations with somebody who had no idea what a piece of music was or how it was constructed, uh, and and his notes were were very helpful and they were they were really good and you know so so that kind of a supportive noting and supportive uh, evolution that was we remain uh, friends with the people who were you know involved in the project since then. I mean we're always yeah. in touch. Uh, Kevin Bannerman, who was our executive producer, Maureen Donnelly, who was our um, you know produced the movie basically. Um, uh, um, uh, Bill Mechanic, I just saw him not too long ago. He was one of the upper ups up there at Fox. He's no longer, he's an independent producer now, but um, you know, we, we try to remain in touch because they really were lovely people That's and you know, just and wanted to make a great movie. And, and the cool thing is that after all of this time, uh, you know, we were able to then adapt the film uh, for, for the stage okay. and, you know, uh, which, which, you know, everybody doesn't get a chance to do that. And when the show came through Los Angeles uh, on tour for the beginning of its second year, we were able to invite all of our LA friends who had worked on the movie yeah, and they all came and it, and it was like a wonderful uh, reunion and just a great chance to catch up after all that time. And, yeah. and Don Bluth, who was the director of the film, the next, uh, the, uh, the next stop was in his uh, home state of, uh, Tempe, Arizona, and he got to see it there. And, you know, he's, he started out in the theater and uh, and now he has a small theater company and then had this whole amazing career in the world of animation. So to be able to bring it back to music theater, which is kind of where he started, that was really cool. It was great, it was great. And the only thing that we did that to, ch well, I won't go on about Anastasia too much longer, but the only thing um, that we did for the stage, other than write a bunch of new songs was um, the whole, gist of the of the, sh the stage show became uh more mature and more um uh, historically accurate than the an than the animated movie and um that's because of terence mcnally who wrote the 
book and who really didn't, he didn't want to just do a slavish representation of an animated movie to the stage. He wanted to really delve into the history and the characters and stuff. And so we eliminated much to the horror of some of the movie fans. We eliminated Rasputin, uh, the dead Rasputin and um, the singing albino bat, Bartok. Mm -hmm. They both got cut, those cartoon characters, because we couldn't, we didn't want to do them. So um, anyway, that's, that's the big difference. But it was, it was just a wonderful, the whole thing was just like, how did we luck out, you know? And, and all the while, while you were, you know, writing the movie, you were working on Ragtime? Yeah. Oh yes. my God, so, and- Oh, uh, this is- In the, one, in like, one time, uh, the, the Avenue of the Star, the Avenue of the Stars, one side, all down one side, were posters for Anastasia, and all down the other side were posters for Ragtime. It was unbelievable, and, and the Schubert Theater was on one side, and the um, 20th Century Fox Studios were on the other side, and we were just like walking down the middle of the street. It was great. It's surreal. And that, that, was, that was for the American premiere, because actually the premiere was in Los Angeles, not New York. Yeah. So the it, it was amazing, and, and, and it was hilarious being out in Los Angeles, because I don't really drive a car. So I, they put me in a little boutique hotel that uh, is no more. It was called the Beverly Prescott. And it was literally walking distance, equidistant from the Fox lot and the Schubert Theater, which is also gone. But uh, that one moment in time was incredible. He doesn't need to drive. I drive. I, I'll drive anywhere. I just have no sense of direction. No so sense of direction. You have a good navigator because you could make the perfect I, driving duo. Well. I am really good. I'm really good at navigating. He's pretty yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's so, all you need. Yeah, we make one good driver. One I just, I just, where do I go now? <laughs> the question is, right. who controls the aux cord? Who, uh, who controls the music while you're in the car? We, there no. can be no music when I'm driving because not when I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. Well, see, I'm the same way with walking down the street where Lynn says you should not wear, you know, back in the day when we had Walkmans and you're listening to your music and she said, don't do that. You're just going to like stump into traffic, you know, and that'll be yeah. that. So yeah. don't do it. That's the fun of New York though, walking around with your headphones on, just the car is. whizzing by you. It's it is. an exciting uh -huh. way to live. Also, it's a great it's a great way to write music too, because sometimes, frankly, I don't know about you know some of your other uh, viewers, but when you're sitting in front of a piano, I would get the feeling that it would go like, oh yeah, with its arms, you know, like prove it. And so there's something about walking around and just free associating ideas. And uh, I get I get some of my best ideas totally away from the piano, but then you just have to keep them in mind, you know, as you race back to try to capture them. Yeah. You know? Lynn, where do you get you? Where do you get your best ideas? Oh, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think probably I, whatever I'm working on, I think about just before I go to sleep. And when I wake up, I usually have a notion. It's usually yeah. a bad one, but it usually leads to something better. You know, I, I do think I work on ideas in my sleep pretty much. I um, I, I also think you know when we're searching uh, and developing a piece. Uh, if we're having a hard time with like any one scene or moment uh, and, and the music's not coming forward, it's just because uh, I don't think I personally have enough information. So I have to like actively ask, what is it that I need to know? What do I need to find out more about? And I have to like literally put that out there and stuff comes to you, you know, but you have to like really analyze what, what's not feeling right about this moment. What, what do I still need to, to know about more? I, I will say that um, research, I, I should have added that, but I, I research everything and I, you know, one now, I mean, we have our wonderful, you know, computers and our internet and little rabbit holes of information that you can follow on any given subject. So um, I think a lot of ideas just come, you, you see a line that's said by a, a Caribbean god and it, it, you think, oh my gosh, that could be a song, you know, it, it, all of the esoteric little details of the world and, you know, Stephen and I, our shows uh, rarely repeat. I don't think they, we've ever really repeated a, a time or a place. It's, so, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're very diverse worlds. And I think part of the um, fun for me is, is doing the research into, you know, 17th century Italy or, uh, you know, uh, antebellum South or, or Paris in the 1800s. You know, it, 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 it's just a wonderful learning experience to write shows that way. Before we get too distracted, I was curious before, I heard an interesting story about um, how you got involved with Ragtime. And I was wondering what the process was like being brought into writing the score for Ragtime, which you I believe you guys won the Tony for Ragtime. 
Yes. 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 Well, you, mm-hmm. we, we were we were lucky. Uh, well, for, frankly, we had to audition to get the to get the show, and that's like really not common. If I, I think it may have happened like maybe twice before in the history, the grand history of musical theater, and uh, I actually thought it was a wonderful break because I I knew how we could do it, or I had a strong hunch, and yet we didn't have anything previously produced that would suggest that. You know, we had a small Caribbean show, the weird Lucky Stiff. Uh, and my favorite year, which is uh, set uh, in the world of live television in the 1950s. So uh, to, to get the chance to be able to read uh, a text by Terrence McNally, Terrence auditioned as well, who wrote a 65 page document that was basically, here's how I would musicalize uh, Dr. Rose's novel for the stage. And then we had to write four songs in, on spec and we counted <laughs> There's a lot of various things going on at that time. We counted on our fingers how many days we would have to work on these, arrange them, go in the studio, record them, produce them, mix them. And we had 11 working days, you know, to write four songs. And, you know, it's like, just go for it. You know, and I I was so excited and and so on fire because I thought thought it was going to be Tander Nem or somebody, you know, some famous person at the time, you know, to, that was going to do that. And for us to have the opportunity, you know, it was, it was great. And we, we, and just to, just to be like, uh, uh, what's, what's the word practical, you know, uh, we, we decided that, uh, I would write two, two music first and Lynn would write two lyrics first and then we'd, we'd switch and, and we did it. That's what, what, wasn't it wonderful that time? It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Of course, my first instinct was, no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> that's what, some, that, that, that's what a, a certain producer told me many years ago. Oh, you know, Lynn passed on it. That passed. I didn't like, do no. It. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I know. But <laughs> I changed my mind. Um, no, it was great. It was just great. And, you know, we had the chance to work with some of the most amazing talents on Broadway ever, you know, Audrey McDonald, Brian Stokes, Mitchell, Marin, Maisie, oh my God, you know, and the list goes on. It was, um, it was one of those once in a lifetime. Everything seems to be once in a lifetime though, because every show is such an amazing experience, you know, for better or for worse, no matter how the show comes out in the end, that one ended very well. Um, so others haven't, and yet they've, been extraordinary experiences um you know like doing rocky in germany uh it didn't have a success on broadway but it had a big success in germany and i wrote a show in a language i don't speak and it was fascinating and living for three months in another country and and you know making friends with all of these people who don't speak your language and yet you know you can communicate it was you know every show is a gift in a way uh uh, eventually you come to think of it that way. Maybe some, not so much at the time, but, but eventually you really do. And I think we're so lucky. I mean, we've had, I think, nine or 10 productions on Broadway. I mean, so, so like, I think that's it. Um, and, you know, plus movies and concerts and all of these different things. And, you know, you just think, gosh, you know, when we never stopped to think about it, we just kept working, which is why the pandemic threw us for such a loop, really, you yeah. know. It's like, and now what? Well, I, it, yeah. We should also say that the show we were working on in Florida, uh, Knoxville, which is based on uh, James Agee's A Death in the Family, uh, our director and the man who's adapting the text from the novel is Frank Bellotti, who was also our director on Ragtime. So it's it's really cool, like after more than t- twenty years later, to be reunited with this incredibly inspirational uh, human being and to be in a rehearsal room again with him. You know, yeah. so we, we look forward to getting back to it. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. It was a really Thanks. great conversation. Can I say one more thing? I feel like I need to say it. I want to come all the way around circle to Nazarene, and I just want to say honestly because I think you know there. I think it will help. I think. If anybody wants to see it, I think you just go to nazarenefilm.com. That's it. Um, and it will tell you how to how to watch it. Um, and I, I, I just think it's important, you know. And, and it's also to sign a petition and, you know, if to become involved, too. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, it's a beautiful film. I highly recommend you, you watch it. And thank you so much for talking to me today.
Thank you so much. Thanks, this Sarah. Cool. Thanks for having us. Thank you to ASCAP, too. Yeah, we love ASCAP. ASCAP, yeah. ASCAP loves you guys. I, I know you guys are probably close with Mr. Michael Kirker. Um, oh, yeah. He's, he's great. Yes. We, we, we spent so many hours and years and weeks and months in the, the workshop there. Yeah. And now it's Stephen Schwartz who's, you know, carrying the torch. Uh, and uh, it, it's a wonderful place for young musical writers uh, to find out how to tell stories through music. For sure. We've been involved with the ASCAP workshop since Charles Strauss was running it. Wow. Uh, what a while. Yes. And, yeah. um, you know, Charles was great too. So, yeah, we go way back with the ASCAP mm -hmm. workshop. We do. Well, all right. Well, this was so fun. Thank you. Thank you. So this was a treat for me. Like I said, you know, I was in many a Once in the Island. I was in many a Seussical, which, oh my God, I love Seussical. <laughs> Were you Gertrude McFuzz? I was not Gertrude McFuzz. I was in the, uh, it was one of my younger ones. So I was in the uh, the chorus, but I have a Gertrude McFuzz sort of voice. Um, you do. I could see that. I think I could have not put that at the park if I was given my opportunity. But. We'll recommend it. <laughs> well, great. Thank you so much, Thanks. Sarah. Guys, have a good no. one. Bye. 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 Thanks, Sarah. If you are interested in checking out an important story in a truly great documentary, Nazarene is now available on Video On Demand. Allison Russell is a self-taught singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist of extraordinary power, talent, and grace. A founding member of the acclaimed groups Our Native Daughters and Birds of Chicago, she has begun to emerge as an incredible creative force. On her upcoming debut solo album, set for release this year, Allison shares the harrowing story of her abusive childhood in a deeply moving, unforgettable song cycle that is ultimately life-affirming. I talked to Allison about her songwriting and how she turned trauma into a triumph of the soul. Here's my conversation with Allison Russell. Welcome, Allison. With Birds of Chicago and then with Our Native Daughters, you have created beautiful, meaningful music. Yet, your first solo album is something altogether different and deeper. On it, you directly explore a very personal and painful part of your past. It sounds like it was music you had to create for your own well-being. Is that true? Yeah, I think that's very perceptive. I think it, it was definitely, you know, a lifetime in the making and um, excavating my, my history was something that I felt more and more compelled to do to kind of reckon with it and to try to come to a place of peace, but on a personal level, but there were other factors. I mean, the work with our native daughters connecting to the pain and the history of the black diaspora and my own family's journey and story um, were very much catalysts for making the solo record and also motherhood you know i'm a, a mom of a now just turned seven-year-old daughter and my history being what it is there i know the high risk of history repeating and part of the way I think that we can stop these cycles of abuse, of bigotry, um, part of the way that we stop the cycle is to talk about it, right. you know, and to face it. And if we don't, then quite often, if we don't reckon with it, unfortunately, too often the cycle continues. And I just, as a, as a mom, could not, I, I had to know that I've done everything in my power to change the story you know to change outcomes for women and children not just women and children of course because this you know abuse is not limited to to women and children you know it's one in three women it's one in four men it's one in two non-binary or trans folks you know it, so it's it's a pandemic really is what it is it's right. you know there are three pandemics that we're in the midst of COVID, of course, and COVID exacerbates the pre-existing pandemics of bigotry and abuse. Right. Um, so to write songs of, of such a nature, I imagine you have to wade through a whole complex range of emotions from fear, anger, shame, hurt. Um, for some writers, that could be very difficult. How did you approach overcoming those challenges, if they were challenges? Well, you know, I think writing has always been a kind of a catharsis for me and a way to process pain. Um, that's always been part of my my writing journey, basically. I mean, that's really how it began. Before I knew that I was a songwriter, I would, you know, be writing poems or 
or stories or journaling. I've always done a lot of journaling as well. Um, and I think that that's just been my medium to process the world and process how I feel about the world and how I feel about my own experiences within it. And as I realized, you know, that I was a musician and started to come out of the closet as a musician, um, I, it was just a natural extension, you know, to start putting some of that into the songs as well. But this is really the first time this, this upcoming solo record is really the first time that I've, um, very gone deeply into this history and excavated my own personal history. And I have not done that very much um, prior to this in the ensemble work that I've done, either with Birds of Chicago or Poe Girl or Our Native Daughters. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely, it, and it's interesting, again, I, I think connecting my history with it that it wasn't that I didn't what happened to me didn't come out of a vacuum you know right. that and and some of the the connections the sort of connecting the dots of from my you know in enslaved great 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 matriarch of my paternal family Kashiba you know who, who her experience of being kidnapped somewhere in West Africa sold off the coast of Ghana surviving that horrific middle passage and multiple abuses, multiple you know, sales, um, enslavers, you know, having her children taken. I mean, just, right. and I and I really had this visceral connection when I learned about her. I didn't meet my uh, paternal family until adulthood. You know, I didn't grow up knowing my black family. I grew up uh, with my Scottish Canadian mother and my adoptive father was an American expat from Southern Indiana who was raised in a white supremacist family, you know, in a sundown town. So he came with a whole set of assumptions about my relative value in the world uh, that obviously he, um, you know, he was my primary abuser and he was also a virulently bigoted human, you know, who filled my ears with poison my entire childhood. So it, it's been a long unpacking process and a long sort of decolonizing of my own mind process right. and own spirit. And that will probably, you know, frankly, that process will probably never end. You know, you refer to shame. And I think that's a big one. I think shame keeps so many people silent and you don't, um, it doesn't go away, you know, or at least in my experience as, as a survivor, and I can't speak for anyone else, but um, it doesn't go away, but you learn to grow around it. You know, I sort of liken it to a rusted chain around a tree and the tree keeps growing and it grows around the chain, but the chain is still there. And, um, you know, part of learning to live with and live in spite of shame is accepting the the truth of the past accepting what happened and hopefully having more and more experiences for me i left that situation at 15 years old and i've had a whole lifetime of many beautiful loving wonderful experiences to to as antidotes to that you know and so part of it is time you know when you ask for me to tell this story i i think it's it's significant and connected that it took me this long to tell it to write it to to go into it I needed time I heard an interview once with Maya Angelou where she talked about um, so and the interview asked her why did you stop you know you're the autobiographical I know why the cage birds why did you stop it mm -hmm. at so you know so young and she said well the rest is too close I can't that's far enough away that I've I've processed it enough that I can write about it but everything that's that was sort of nearer in the timeline to what her actual existence, she wasn't ready to excavate that yet. And I think there is a lot to that. I think in order to process trauma, we need time, you know, mm -hmm. and that, and I've had time and I've had a lot of love and I've had a lot of community support. And that's the other big part of this equation. I, it's a solo record, but I could not have made this solo record without my, unbelievably generous, loving, supportive community and chosen family. Um, you know, my partner, JT, who is my, my frequent writing partner, as well as, right. you know, my life partner and the father of my daughter and um, 
our daughter, I should say. And, you know, it's all of the incredible musicians who, who poured their hearts and spirits into this record. I mean, we recorded it over four days at the Sound Emporium in Nashville, and we actually recorded it um, in the fall of 2019. So just after, you know, I'd come back from that tour uh, with our Native daughters, this incredible experience of all of us on the bus with all of our kids. Oh, wow. And a, a camera crew from the Smithsonian because they were turning the experience into a documentary that's actually going to come out um, next month in February. Oh, wonderful. And yeah, just, you know, so it was this whole journey. And I was writing a lot of these songs that ended up becoming a solo record on the bus, you know, sending things back and forth with my partner, JT, you know, via, because I was on the bus with our daughter and he was doing a writer's retreat. And um, I think he was in, Massachusetts somewhere or New Hampshire somewhere and you know we were sending these ideas back and forth and I was just it was at night after shows and interviews and all the rest of it sharing a little bunk with my daughter it was her first time sleeping on a tour bus and you know I was just scribbling scribbling these songs they're just pouring out and they were a lifetime in the making but they they actually kind of um arrived quite close together over a period of about three months starting on that bus that our native daughter's bus and the last the last ones i was writing on the airplane you know on on the way home from from tour to nashville where where we live now and uh we we were coming home for americana fest actually in 2019 and everybody you know all of my beloved community happened to be in town the sound emporium happened to have four days open and I just discovered that the Canada Council of the Arts in which is a wonderful arts funding organization in Canada um, had had supported my my writing request for a writing grant and a recording grant and that so suddenly we had the means to be able to do this you know thanks to the Canada Council and we just did it and honestly when we began I was still telling myself well maybe this is just a bird's record you know, where it's a little bit more <laughs> autobiographical, but, right. you know, and my husband was like, sure, sweetie. And my producer, Dan Nobler was like, okay. And of course, by the end of it, it was very clear that this was a solo statement, that this was a very personal statement and needed to be its own, live in its own space. Right. And, um, and so, you know, and then we were touring, we were touring with birds. I was working with our native daughters. I didn't really, we, we made it in four days and I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. You know, wrapping my mind around trying to put myself forward as a solo artist. There, I had a lot of shame related blocks around that. And the pandemic happened and suddenly I had all this time to process and sort of meditate and plan of, you know, what, what, what could a career look like coming out of this? You know, we had been, JT and I had been so used to the the grind of sort of subsistence touring on the road. We felt like we weren't doing our jobs if we weren't touring 200 days of the year. Right. So to be forced to stop was was quite a shock, but also really beneficial for us to, to assess and make some changes, you know. And I had the opportunity, we, we met our manager, Carissa Stolting, who's just wonderful through our friend Abigail Washburn during this pandemic time or just before. And, you know, been on this whole journey of finding the right home for the record and the right team to support it. Um, and I've just been so fortunate. And all along the way, it's been community, making those connections, uplifting, you know, just, there's a wonderful quote that I heard um, Rachel Cargill say, and I believe it's an Alice Walker quote. And the quote is, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And I've really felt that in this time of all these challenges that are being thrown at the arts communities, particularly gig workers. Um, we are supporting each other through it, you know, as best we can. And I've really felt that from our community here in Nashville. Well, yeah. well, it sounds like the planets certainly aligned for you to be able to make this record. Um, mm -hmm. Now, on your website, you share this uh, eloquent and beautiful story um, about who you are. You know what you've what you've experienced and and uh, what brought you to live in Nashville. Um, mm -hmm. 
And, you know, you say you are a hero of your own story and that we all are. Um, in what way has music played into that part of your story? In every way. I mean, I was, I would not, I would not, I, it's not an exaggeration to say I would not have survived my childhood um, or teenhood without, if I hadn't discovered music, I don't know that I would still, or rather music discovered me, I don't know that I would be among the living um, at this point. Mm -hmm. And I can't really overstate it. I think there's an interesting thing happening in our culture where we tend to minimize the importance of the arts. You know, we, you see it in schools, the, 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 yeah. the first funding to get cut is arts funding. The focus is on STEM and, and, and by no means am I um, denigrating STEM. That's very important too, but the arts are crucial and it's, they're crucial for whether you're going to pursue that as a career or just as an outlet and particularly for young beings trying to grow up in a very complicated, contradictory, scary world at times. Art is an outlet, you know, and I've been seeing that with our daughter through these stresses of the pandemic. She's been painting up a storm. These, this is some of her work behind me right now. Wonderful. And, you know, just that has been a huge outlet for her. She's been writing little songs, um, you know, making up plays and dances. I mean, this has been, and it's not just her, it's all of our, our you know, our community's children. I've seen this outpouring of, of artistic process. And many of them won't become, you know, professional artists, but it's of such deep value. And we're understanding that more on, on every level, that the empathy that it builds, the empathy that's needed in every career, every part of life, every part of human interaction that we've seen, unfortunately, such a dearth of lately. And um, it's, you know, music saved my life and having that outlet and the people that I've met, the community that I've met through music, though that's, you know, led me to my life partner. It's led me to my closest friends, my sisters and our native daughters, mm -hmm. my brothers and sisters and birds of Chicago, my brothers and sisters and capital sunrays, my sisters and Poe girl, like these are, this is family community. And we, we are we are understanding now with this pandemic as, as so many of us are experiencing greater isolation than we ever have before, how important that human connection is and that community that we, we cannot thrive without it. And we're, so we're finding ways to do it, whether it's, you know, through a virtual festival or a zoom interview mm -hmm. or writing songs, you know, doing those, we did a bunch of those, um, Rihanna and Giddens and Layla McCalla and Amethyst Kia and I, my, my sisters and our native daughters did lots of distanced um, videos together during the pandemic. And that was so much fun to do, you know, where we'd each record one little piece of it and then put it together remotely, obviously. And, you know, we played Carnegie Hall that way. <laughs> it was virtually and distanced in a video that was cobbled together, but it feel, it still felt like community, you know, and it is, it's still community. And, um, I just think everyone is seeing that. I've, I've heard that from so many people, people who aren't, you know, artists or songwriters, just reaching out and saying how grateful they are for, you know, whether it's a live stream or a little song you share or a poem, like these things. Help. I mean, we saw it with Amanda Gorman's incredible healing poetry at the inauguration, the, the visceral response to that from the whole world, you know, not just this nation there's a reason Wor words, poetry, music, art, they, they touch us on a, on a deep internal universal human level. And it helps us connect to each other. It helps us connect to our humanity, our forgiveness, our forbearance, our compassion, our empathy. And we can't, we can't live without that. And we're in very complicated times. And we need, that's when empathy is the most needed. When we are the most divided and in turmoil, that's when empathy is the most needed. So wow. I think that songs have a huge part to play in that. So, yeah. um, well, that's a beautiful note to end on. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the amazing things about this time period is we've found a way to stay connected despite the challenges and that when things open up again, there will be such a hunger 
for connection, which which only music can can deliver in a certain way. Um, that you know, I hope you and and all of your you know creative friends are are will be ready for that moment. And and uh, we're so ready, yeah. <laughs> we're so ready. It's gonna be so joyful when we get to the herd levels of inoculation and immunity and we can actually fling the doors wide again and dance in the street it's going to be wonderful yeah ASCAP is thrilled to present the Sundance ASCAP Music Cafe running from Friday January 29th through Monday February 1st Join us virtually for four days of exclusive performances from an incredible array of songwriters and artists, as well as conversations with ASCAP composers and filmmakers with works in this year's festival. For more information, visit ascap.com slash Sundance 2021. That's a wrap. Thanks to everyone who made this podcast possible. Sundance's Charlie Sextro, ASCAP Sarah Feingold, co-writers Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty, the wonderful Allison Russell, Sam Hollander and Josh Edmondson for our great new theme music, Aton Rosenblum for editorial finesse, Rachel Choi for graphic design, Kate Cordova for social media support, and Benjamin Keynes of SightSense Productions for audio and video editing. If you'd like to check out our show notes and listen to music mentioned in this episode, visit ascap.com slash versed. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next time.